to recover in their in their rate cases. You know how much of this, um, you know, so so it's not necessarily that the federal and the state governments are on the same page on some of this. Uh, you run into the same issues with cybersecurity as well. The feds will pass regulations. Um, you can change the definition of what is the bulk electric grid, for example, and now suddenly there's a whole lot more systems that are impacted that. And the feds may have you know one opinion, and the state um, you know the states may feel very differently. So. Those are those are real issues that are actually playing out, you know, today as we speak, um, and uh, it, it's it's uncertain how it's going how it's going to play out. Uh, from a business perspective, you talked about 15 years out from smart grid. If I'm developing that little smart chip that we use in the phone to catch their teenagers, from a business perspective, in R and D, am I doing something different? Looking at that 15 years down the road, am I taking that into consideration with my R and D now as I start my small and from a legal perspective, am I doing something with my contracts now to avoid the liability? Can I avoid the liability? Is there something, again, 15 years down the road, I'm a small company, I want to be around in 15 years. From R&D and legal perspectives, what am I doing? Let me answer the technical question you asked me. <laughs> uh, if I look at, well, see the main advantage of looking at 15 years from now is you don't want to develop a you know, buggy when you know that there'll be motor cars on the road. I think. I think that's the main thing you need to look at. Uh, I think there are a lot of future opportunities which are going to come your way. And if you really start thinking about what's coming 15 years from now, where is what's happening right now? So right now, a lot of that is happening is because people get all this stimulus money and they're scrambling around to find ways to spend it and to do everything they can. Not everything is long-term sustainable. So you really want to hitch your back into something which is long-term. And that's why you need to look 15 years from now, especially for a small Company because you can't afford to make mistakes going in the wrong direction. So for that reason, you not only need to consider your little chip if it's going to be useful today, but will it be used for 10 years from now, 15 years from now? So I think that's that's the basic business strategy I would use. So look, if there are several different things I can do, one has more long-term potential goes to the other, you know, I would take a little bit more profit right now for the long-term gain because things are going to evolve in the long run. And a lot of the things that are happening today are not going to work. Give you 10 to 15 percent technology that is being developed today is going to work. That's typically what happens when you know innovation just starts. A lot of people start doing a lot of things. Some of these things stick, and they lead to the evolution. That's what happened in the internet. You know, the internet started. A lot of technologies came around, and some survived. Some didn't. Same thing is going to happen with another legal perspective. So I guess what I would say is the the biggest thing to do legally is don't buy into the hype. Don't buy into the hype that by sort of glomming on to smart grid technology efforts, you can focus your core legal strategy there. You can't. You need to continue to watch the development of law across time. So for example, when distributed denial of service attacks started to occur on the in internet, who did them? People who wanted power. People who thought it was fun. People who wanted to intimidate others. Who does that now? Organized crime. If you don't spot those shifts, that, that that type of change in the character and nature of the behavior will drive legal change. And so if you've got a couple of kids trying to do something and you have uh, 200 computers that were used in a denial of service attack by those kids, uh, that's one thing. If there becomes a general awareness that organized crime is conducting extortion activities and now your computers are used, the law might take a different view of your insecure systems. And so to that extent, if you're talking about a chip and a phone, you've got to think through all of the normal business liability issues. So a chip and a phone is a product. You've got potential product liability issues. You've got issues of uh, social engineering and uh, release of confidential information from your company. All of these tie into the additional issues that flow out of the grid. So I think you've got to keep a constant awareness of the complexity and almost keep a map of it as you move forward. I, I don't have any prediction for where the state of the law of this will be in 15 years, but I would not have predicted the internet 15 years ago. I was involved in the internet 15 years ago. Did I register McDonald's.com? No, I did not. So my goal is to keep up with where it is now and to try to give the best advice we can. That's the best thing I can say to a business. I don't think there's a change now other than strictly maintain your holistic view. I, I think the big difference big difference is from the standpoint of, if you compare again, if you're comparing internet with, with the electric utility, the internet, there were no rules. As you as you went along and as people built businesses, the rules came along. That's when the rules got implemented. On this side of the fence, the 
rules exist. You can't do anything new. You have to change the rules to try and implement new technology and to put the stuff in place. So, so you have to make an effort to go and change those rules. That's the key difference. Would you agree, Mary? I, I think it's very fair. Yes, back there. Uh, I guess my concern for the future of potential consumer would be what kind of privacy expectation would consumers have with a uh, smart grid system, not only with regards to um, between other consumers that might potentially try to see what I'm doing in my house, but also the government might be interested in monitoring uh, consumers. It, it'll be a developing regime. California has some rules about what can be done with the information. Um, certainly issues about cybersecurity would set uh, the standard for liability if let's say your neighbor did hack into your, uh, your smart meter and could see what you were doing. It could hack it and turn on your coffee maker. What, what's the, the grid's liability there? Much of that's gonna come out of the regulation between the utility and the state through their, uh, through their various proceedings and the regulations that the states have for them. And generally, generally, the standard that's been negotiated is normal negligence is something a, a utility is not liable for, at least in terms of outages. Will that translate over? I would guess they'll push pretty hard for it too. And so if they're just negligent in the standards for security that they implement that keep or don't keep your neighbor out of your toaster and burning your toast every morning because your dog barks, um, <laughs> then they wouldn't be liable. But they're grossly negligent using old technology, et cetera. We're still not sure, but it's closer there because you at least have a relationship with them. Um, and those are developing standards. I, as a general rule, you don't have many rights to privacy. Whether the FTC will step in would depend on how the utilities sell it. And so if the utility says, oh, this is great technology that keeps everybody safe and better electric, that might be some sort of false advertising I don't know that's where you want to hang your hat in terms of privacy. So California has some rules about what can be done with the information once the utility gets it, because what's going to happen with that information? The utility may sit and look at it and go, okay, we can, that's useful for us in planning and infrastructure, but off on the side are going to be marketing folks who run things like DoubleClick, who are going to be drooling, going, oh, I can find out what time they get up in the morning. I can sell him the new coffee maker that makes coffee faster. And, how that's gonna work, we don't have those rules yet. What's gonna to happen to that information once it gets out? We don't even know who owns that information. If the utility aggregates information about when you charge your car or when you use your washer and dryer, when you watch your television or use your DVR, who owns that? It's a really good question. What about, what about the government's access to information? So if they wanna inquire within activities that are normally within the home, but we also expect to be private, It's one of the examples we think of, right? Because we have these situations now where the police can drive with the infrared cameras that see the heat coming out of the house. Um, and we know that where they have some suspicion, they can issue a subpoena and get information from a utility about where lots of electricity is being used. So I think for the government to get the information, they wouldn't just be able to, just like they can't come in your house, why can't they come in your house? Because the Constitution says they can't, right? What's the problem with the information that's off-site? The Constitution doesn't apply to it as well. Why? Because the constitutional requirement is a reasonable expectation of privacy. And generally, the courts have said, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the information you've given to somebody else. What happens then? Statutory and regulatory rules come into play, like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, that tells government when it can get it. Is the ECPA as strong as the Constitution? Not by a long shot. All sorts of things the government can do to get what's called pen and trap information from telephones. And what's happening in the EU right now is um, data retention for transmission data for content, so that you know who an email was sent to, when it was sent, and who sent it. Not the content of it, that's, that still almost always requires a wiretap. And the Wiretap Act does require a more detailed precision in why you want the content. <coughs> is when you use your toaster or how much electricity you use content? or is that process-based information? We haven't categorized it yet. So 
So, so from a, can I just uh, maybe set your mind at ease? For, uh, currently, um, the, the utility takes a very strong position that the data from the meter actually belongs to the customer and the utility protects it on behalf of the customer. And currently, in order for, uh, you, you may have seen some advertisements about uh, energy marketers. There really needs to be some relationship between that energy marketer and the utility to in order to allow that conversation on the customer's behalf. But, but you're absolutely right in asking the question going forward. Uh, certainly there are you know, uh, business folks that would love the opportunity to, to uh, understand how those behavior patterns occur and what appliances are being used. I, I don't know from a utility perspective where that's gonna where that's gonna head, but I can tell you right now there's active discussions going on as to, you know, whether or not the utilities want to agree, the utilities meaning in general, to, uh, to to behave in a different way or take a different stand on behalf of the customers. Okay. Um. What I'm going to say is uh, we have uh, we have a networking reception right after this, and uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to invite you to come to the networking reception, which is just outside, and, and our panelists will still be around. Uh, if you have individual questions, you can probably come and talk to them directly and uh, and get them answered. So I want to thank uh, our panelists first of all to be here. And I want to thank all of you also for coming, and I'll see you over at the reception. Thank you again for coming.